Hi, everyone. As you are all coming in, we want to get a sense of who you are here with. So I'm going to drop a poll onto the screen. If you're watching from Zoom, you can answer the poll. And I'll be back in a little bit. All right, everyone. Good morning. All right, everyone. So we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to Dino Fest at Home. This is a week long festival celebrating everything dinosaurs brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So we're so happy you're here. My name is Ilana Gustafson. I am manager of performing arts at NHM. And I'm here to introduce your host and to help you all get settled and ready to enjoy our dino puppet meet and greet. So we'll be together for about 30 minutes and you'll get, get to meet some amazing performers and puppets. So um, before we jump into the presentation, we're going to do a little housekeeping first. So today's program, I'm happy to say, will be interpreted in Spanish. So if you're interested in this feature, you can find the full instructions on NHM's DinoFest webpage, but I'm also going to help talk you through how to get that started. So if you are on Zoom, you will see a button for interpretation on the bottom right of the screen. So you can click that button and choose either English or Spanish. And if you'd prefer for the original audio to be muted, you can choose that interpretation button again and select the mute original audio. And we will also be adding instructions in Spanish into the chat box so you can check that out. So speaking of the chat, I wanna let you know that uh, we are so happy you are here, but we can't see any of you. You can only see us right now. So to answer your questions, we're going to use the chat function. So at the end of our presentation, we will have a Q&A. We may not get to all of your questions, but we will do our best. So during the presentation, you can click on the chat box to type a question, or you can ask your adult to help type in a question for you. And we'll answer that at the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully, we'll get to it. So your chat box might look a little different depending on what device you're using now. So if you're on a tablet, like an iPad, the chat button will be in the upper right hand corner. And if you're on a computer or laptop, like a Chromebook, your chat button will be on the bottom in the middle. The chat but button will also be on the bottom middle if you're on your phone. So you can type your question directly into the chat for our team to see it. And your question will only be seen by museum staff who are running the Zoom right now. And if you are watching on YouTube, the chat function is disabled. It's a new YouTube rule for kids programming. All right, and just to let you know behind the scenes, we have a lot of people helping out with our program. We have Mark Witten, who's operating our slideshow. We have Betsy, John, and Christina who are helping answer your questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, 
um, I want to let you know that I will share some news with you about how you can join our paleontologists live today in our fossil lab. So stay tuned at the very end. I will tell you more about that. All right. So now I would like to introduce our presenter today, Mr. Jonathan Williams. He is a performing artist from our performing arts team, and he will be introducing you to our other special guests. So I'll see you in the Q&A. Take it away, John. Thanks, Alana. Hello, everyone. Welcome to DinoFest at home. We're online this year, so unfortunately we can't do it in person, but that means you can be anywhere and i'm kind of grateful for that because i hear that there are some uh, students watching from seneca valley middle school outside of pittsburgh pennsylvania that my mom is teaching so hi mom how you doing mrs b representing uh let me uh get straight into it here then let's introduce our uh dino puppet pal right here coming to you this is sauropodomorph a yeah that's not a very uh, descriptive name that's very strange kind of vague uh so this species of dinosaur uh was actually very recently discovered uh so recently in fact that the scientists have not come up with a proper name for the species yet uh so we can't have a name for the species but maybe we can think of a um a name just for this individual here so i'm going to give you some time if you want to suggest a name in the chat Go ahead and type that in. There's also a nickname that uh, some of the paleontologists came up uh, with as well. Uh, I'll give you some time to think of that. And uh, Alana, feel free to pop in if you uh, if you see something uh, good like that. But this is a uh, a baby uh, dinosaur. The fossils of this one were only juveniles. They were only four or five years old uh, that they found these fossils of. And this one was probably even younger representation. This is maybe a one and a half year old dinosaur. So it's not super big. So if we have, I see a lot of names coming through there. If there's yeah, anything so that catches our eye. I'll, I'll offer a few because yeah, we've got okay. so many good ones and you can choose. So sure. we've got um, Kiki, Rocket, mm -hmm. Pal, Aqua, or Bumpy. Those are some that stood out I, to me. I like Kiki. I'm going with Kiki. Um, so my... Uh, I'm hosting. I, I get to choose uh, ultimately. So let's all say hello to Kiki. Um, now, so I mentioned that uh, Kiki uh, here, <laughs> their fossils were recently discovered. And I wanted to ask you a question. We're going to take another poll with this question. Uh, the fossils were so recently discovered. I wanted to ask you where you think uh, these fossils were discovered? Uh, on which continent uh, of the Earth do you think they were discovered? Uh, so we're going to put up that poll that will let you choose. And don't worry, there's no consequences for this poll. It's, it's fine to be, <laughs> to be wrong. I just want to get a sense of what you think. If Kiki had a long journey here or not, whether Kiki came from South America, Europe, Asia, North America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica. Um, it could be any of these things. Uh, because actually paleontologists, they go on fossil excavations all over the world from, on every continent uh, that is available to excavate from. So, yeah, um, we'll see. I, I can give you an idea, maybe. Uh, we chose green for uh, Kiki here specifically because of some fossil evidence that suggests that Kiki's environment was a kind of lush, green, kind of swampy place uh, when Kiki was roaming the earth, to be specific. So um, let's see how we're doing with the poll. Alrighty. A lot of people say South America. Other people say North America. All right, it's time for the big reveal then. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be surprising as the least number of you chose this option. Kiki's fossils were actually found in Antarctica. Antarctica, yes. This icy tundra here. This is a picture of the base camp uh, where the paleontologists uh, start when they're on their excavations in Antarctica. Uh, you know, that's just where they start. In order to get to where they're actually digging up the fossils, they have to take a helicopter that you can see there. And you can see there, they're at a place where the ice isn't. So they're not pulling these fossils out of the ice. Um, that ice is melting 
due to climate change, unfortunately. And the only silver lining we have of that is that it allows us to find these fossils that are in the rocks there underneath all that ice on the continent of Antarctica, as we'll have a picture showing up right after this of, yeah, some fossils right there. Now, you're probably a little upset that I gave you that clue of why we chose green. Uh, Antarctica is not green now, obviously, and it's becoming less icy. Um, the climate was different in Kiki's time. This was maybe 190 million years ago in the Jurassic period, and Antarctica was not where it was today. Uh, you may be familiar with the idea of Pangaea, when all the Earth's continents were together in a supercontinent. Well, after Pangaea, a little after, they separated a little bit more, and there was an area called Gondwana, or Gondwana land, and that's where Antarctica was then, a little bit further north, so it was not as cold there. It was a little bit warmer. The rest of the world was probably a lot hotter than Antarctica was, but... Uh, but that's the reason um, that we found that there are fossil evidence of plants that had leaves and they can tell that those plants uh, shed their leaves depending on the season. Uh, they have growth rings that show the difference of seasons in that as well. So Kiki here was a fun loving plant eating dinosaur in a lush swampy Antarctica, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yes, an adorable, adorable Kiki that way. Excellent. Uh, so in terms of how the climate was changing, though, that was due to the tectonic activity, and that took place over millions of years. And in terms of how Kiki is different, uh, how Kiki's Antarctica <laughs> changed to what it to what Antarctica is today. I mean, we've even seen changes within our lifetimes when, when talking about the perspective of geology and those lengths of time. That's a very short amount of time uh, and a little concerning. <laughs> So right now, uh, I'd like to transition uh, to uh, talk to you about uh, how we do what we do, a little bit why we do what we do. Maybe some people uh, are wondering why there's a performing arts department at a natural history museum. Um, artists and scientists work together all the time, and we are in Los Angeles, uh, entertainment capital of the world, some say. Uh, Hollywood. So we have a lot of opportunity to do that. But actually, scientists and artists are not uh, strange collaborators in any way. There's lots of ways that can happen. Uh, there's even a video about our scientific illustrator uh, at the Natural History Museum who works alongside uh, the paleontologist and on fossil digs as well. And this is our artist, uh, Eli Presser. He was manipulating the puppet. He's our technical uh, supervisor. So he fixes things when they break, which is often and uh, I'll let him introduce himself uh, <laughs> more in his own words, if you want to. Hey there, everyone. Away. How you doing? <laughs> uh, we'll be answering any questions you have. So, uh, you know, feel free to keep them coming and we'll answer as many as we can. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to, uh, we'll be best at answering questions about puppetry and the collaboration of artists. If you have some more scientific questions, I'll do my best. I am not a scientist. I have talked to the scientists. I know a little bit, um, but that's what we'll be best at. If you want to learn more super specific uh, dinosaur questions and especially Antarctic dinosaur questions, I would suggest checking out the Paleo Chat tomorrow uh, with Dr. Nathan Smith, who has actually been um, to Antarctica on these fossil digs and everything like that. So if you have any questions there, Alana, is there anything coming up so far? Yeah, it looks like we, we have um, some questions about the puppet, um, and Kevin would like to know if the puppet is real. So maybe you can talk a little bit, Eli, about... Um... Well, hey, Kevin. Yeah, sure. So the puppet is real. It is a real puppet. It is not, obviously, it is not the dinosaur. The dinosaurs um, uh, were, went extinct a long time ago. So this is a, a representation of what we thought it might be. Uh, and of course, this puppet, it's not alive, but we do what we can to try and make it appear as if it's alive. Um, we actually have the puppeteer who made this, uh, Robin Walsh is watching with us. Uh, Robin made this puppet um, and uh, worked with paleontologists at the museum to come up with an idea of what that puppet might look like. Yeah. And along those lines, um, Inez would like to know how you operate the puppet. So this, uh, this type of puppet is called a marionette. We use a uh, controller to operate it with strings. So this puppet has uh, strings going all over it. 
Uh, you can see here, they're hard to see on this screen, but there's springs coming off the head, one going through this point of the nose. That's what we use to operate this mouth. If you look at it here, you can see, right? That's traveling through the nose of the puppet. And then uh, we pull on that. And all of it is controlled by this controller right here. Uh, when I'm operating it, these two pieces come off. This controller is what we use for the head. This is the mouth one that I'm squeezing right here. And these other strings connect other points to the head. In the same way, here's the back piece. And we use this to control the main body of it. These strings are going to its hips. These are going to its shoulders. This one right here is its tail. So when I want to get the tail moving, I might move it right there. And they can look very different. Every puppet we use has different ways of controlling it. Sometimes we use sticks, strings, just our hands. It all depends. Great. And one more puppet question. Um, Randy would like to know, and I know you mentioned that Robin is watching, but wanted to know if you made the puppet. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how the puppet was made and who made it. So I, I did not make this puppet. I operate it. Uh, Robin Walsh, another puppeteer here in LA, made it for us, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and that process would have been, I, I know we had some slides on this. Um, we can look here, here's a uh, illustration she did, right? Robin would have started off by uh, talking to paleontologists at the museum, getting a sense of what they thought a good representation of this animal would be. And then she started doing some sketches. This is a, uh, when we, uh, when we uh, oftentimes, when you're making something like this, you might draw in your sketchbook somewhere else, but then you wanna blow it up to the sides that it will actually be so you get a look at it so you can kind of see how there's a uh, almost a collage of these images she would have probably uh used those pa that paper just to get it larger if you're wondering why it looks like that um then she uh went from that point she made this a, a foam cutout representation of it so this is still operating in a similar way she would have used this to figure out how big the control needed to be um, make sure that the strings were going where she wanted them to be. So this one would have been just made out of it looks like foam core in this case, off of that drawing. And then finally, after that, she would have begun sculpting the puppet. And we can see that process here. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Eli, for sharing that. Some inside tips on how we made our puppet. Um, so we have a question here uh, about your job. Um, you know, wanting to know. Angelica wants to know: Is your job cool? So maybe you could talk a bit about what you do and what our team at the museum does. Sure. You want to start that off, John? Or should I sure. Go? Yeah. I mean, mostly we just feed off of the excitement everyone already has for dinosaurs, right? And we try to engage people and hopefully teach them a little something about what we're doing uh, so that they can get more involved and ask more questions, uh, do their own research and things like that. Um, we want to help bring them to life a little bit um, from, from the fossils that are there and from the science that is there. So we have representations of what dinosaurs might have been like. And to be sure, it's just, yeah, this is one of our uh, giant dino puppets that we would be doing um, pre-COVID times and hopefully again soon one day. That's a Triceratops puppet, a juvenile one. And that's one that we fully crawl inside. So we've got lots of different types of puppets to, uh, to do that. These are some squirrel puppets. Robin also made those. Um, so uh, we, we have some uh, friendlier ways to engage with wildlife like that. And again, it's to start conversations and it's because it's fun. We also do lots of, um, what am I trying to say? Workshops and things with students uh, like yourselves out there. And Eli can speak more um, uh, on those types of things because he has, um, you know, constructed those workshops and led those workshops most uh, most from everyone. But a lot of people contribute to make them possible as well. And so it's just to help get a tactile sense of something we can't physically see because these creatures are extinct and we do it because it's fun um, and we do it because it's cool and we do it because it's fun to learn that way um, and artists uh, work alongside scientists all the time any representation you've seen of a dinosaur that isn't the fossils 
that means an artist helps create that in collaboration with those uh, paleontologists, and whether it's for uh, educate, education and using all the information we have to get a representation of what it might have been like, or whether it's a movie like Jurassic Park or Jurassic World where it's mostly for fun and exciting and a thrill and things like that. And so what we do is kind of a combination of that. I think that's enough for me. If Eli, if you want to jump in on anything or we can move to another question, depending on... Why don't we, uh, let's move ahead to another question. If we yeah. Can. Yeah. All right. Give me a moment and sure. let's see. Um, so... Um, let's move on to, we have a couple questions about, um, where the dino was found. Can you, John, reiterate, um, first of all, the scientific name of this, um, dinosaur puppet, um, or the, the puppet, I mean, the dinosaur that it's modeled after. Sure. And then also the question from Sable is, is this the first time we're digging for dinos in Antarctica and have other fossils been found there? Ah, that's great. So Kiki, our puppet here, is a representation of the species that is only known right now as Sauropodomorph A. There's a Sauropodomorph B. Sauropodomorph is a, a an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different dinosaurs. There are smaller umbrellas under that, like sauropods. Uh, those are ones like Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, those big long neck ones. Um, those came along later. They weren't around in, in Kiki's time for Sauropodomorph A. And yes, so these fossils were discovered in Antarctica and there have been ongoing excavations in Antarctica for decades. And there's international groups, uh, paleontologists from all over the world uh, collaborate there and work together. They have plant fossils, dinosaur fossils, um, other sort of uh, flying reptiles. A flying reptile would be like, you know, like a like a pterosaur, like a pterodactyl, things like that. Um, there have been marine reptiles. There have been other fossils of precursors to mammals that were very small at the time. So lots of things like that. Uh, yeah. Um, so Antarctica, <laughs> all the way down there at the South Pole. And again, they're they're digging them out of the rock and not the the ice and frozen tundra part. Uh, I know the paleontologist Nate Smith was very adamant that we uh, talk about that uh, fact that they're not frozen in ice. They are excavating from the rock. And I think that's that's about as much as I have of information on that. So I hope that was helpful. That Thank was you, great. Sable. That was wonderful, John. Uh, so uh, another question related to Antarctica, they want to know um, how, how it's gone from being green and lush to snowy and icy. I know you, you talked sure. about that in your presentation, yeah. but maybe go into that a bit more. Yeah. So over the course of millions of years with the shift of plate tectonics, um, Antarctica slowly moved to where it is today at the South Pole. And I mentioned before Pangaea. Uh, you may be familiar with that. You may be not. But that's the idea that um, all the continents used to be one supercontinent. And again, over the course of a very, very long time, millions of years, they slowly separated. And because they were in different places on the Earth, the climate was very different then. And part of the reason they know this are from the different fossils that they found. So there are plant fossils that show the green lush uh, aspect of Antarctica. They found those fossils in Antarctica, on the tip of South America, on the tip of Africa and South Africa, the tip of India and Australia. And so those fossils were in all of those places that are very far, far apart now. And that led them, that was one of the things that led them to start believing in the plate tectonics that um, Pangaea, that they were once all together in the same area because all those fossils existed um, right there. And those plants need specific uh, environmental conditions to thrive and grow and exist. So yeah. There you go. Great. And we have time for maybe about one more question. Okay. So to everyone in the chat, um, there have been a lot of questions. We'll, we'll explain how you can share more of your questions with us later. Um, so I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. But uh, one last question for Eli. If you could go into a little bit more about um, how you worked with our paleontologists, you and Robin worked with our paleontologists to create um, this particular marionette? Well, um, obviously, uh, Robin could speak in greater depth to that question, of course, uh, but um, we, uh, the process would have been that uh, uh, Robin would have met uh, for, uh, well, you know, this all falls under something that we would refer to as paleo arts. So that's uh, the representation through arts of paleontology. 
Uh, and that process involves uh, speaking to people who work on the, on the science end of that to create representations uh, using different art forms. Um, so in this case, Robin uh, spoke to paleontologists at the Natural History Museum. Uh, we were working on an exhibit at the time uh, about Antarctic dinosaurs. Uh, so um, there was a lot of information available and they were interested in us uh, talking about this particular type of animal, the uh, sauropodomorph. Um, which was this, you know, other sort of a, a very different idea of what this, uh, this kind of animal can be like, uh, behavior in terms of its behavior and its uh, physiology. Um, and so Robin worked with them to create something that fell somewhere in between. Uh, if we look at the, uh, this puppet, uh, John talked about the color, of course. Um, uh, so that coloration would have been based on uh, comparative anatomy, looking at animals in the region. Uh, thinking about the size of this animal, et cetera, and uh, trying to think of what those colors might have been in the same way. We look at these, um, these claws right here. Uh, these are a little different than we might normally think of a sauropod certainly having. Uh, and on this sauropodomorph, uh, we see a very different type of claw. Uh, then there would have been uh, experimentation, looking at what we wanted in terms of movement. Uh, a lot of puppetry is, you know, uh, about moving an object and trying to make it live. So we, uh, we the puppeteers and Robin, and looking at the mechanisms of this puppet, would have came up with a, a process to uh, develop movements that we thought might connect. Obviously, uh, it's not um, necessarily alive, uh, but, but we're trying to get a, an idea of how those movements might have looked. All right, well, thank you both for answering these questions. Um, thank you so much, John. Thank you all. I am muted, there we go, now I'm not. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks so much for, for sticking around with us. I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of how we as artists collaborate with paleontologists to try and develop a little bit clearer picture of what our prehistoric world might have uh, been like. If you want to maybe try your hand at making a dino puppet of your own, you can check out our DIY shadow puppet activity that's on the Dino Fest uh, webpage there. If you want to learn more about how artists collaborate with scientists, there's also a nice video from our scientific illustrator Stephanie at the museum that goes into a little bit of depth of, of what she does every day out in the field, in the lab, and and whatnot is that and if you want to share any of these pictures of things you're making um, you can send them to us you can post it on on insta you can tag us all the things please uh feel free to do that we would love to see what you're doing um that would be fantastic and then uh that's all i have so i'm gonna send it back to alana uh for her to tell us how you can um see some some live uh things happening in our dino lab thanks a lot everyone Bye for now. All right. Well, I just want to share with you that we have a special event happening today, Wednesday, September 23rd at 1230. So just an hour from now, we're going to be streaming live from inside the fossil lab at NHM. So uh, Dr. Luis Chiappi, who is our senior vice president of research and collections and the Gretchen Augustine director of our Dinosaur Institute, he'll be giving a special behind the scenes tour of this working paleontological lab and the real fossils being prepared and studied within it. It's pretty cool. Um, and that'll be on Instagram Live. So tune in, ask your dinosaur questions there. And if possible, make a contribution to support active research at NHM. So with a donation of any size, you'll help Dino, NHM's Dino Institute team and the rest of NHM scientists and historians continue their vital research. So. For help viewing, visit Instagram's Help Center. And that's it for us today. We are so happy you were able to join us. Enjoy the rest of DinoFest. Bye, everyone. <laughs>